Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. Is this the year of the boomerang or what? It may turn out that Stormy Daniels' lawyer, Michael Evanotti, gossiped about Michael Cohen being the one who came up with the plan to extort the hush money from Donald Trump. And after Jon Stewart tried to blame President Trump for inflating the value of his property, it looks like Stewart may be guilty of inflating the value of a house that he sold by nearly 10 times the value. ABC's lawyers are asking for more time in the defamation case that President Trump filed against ABC in Stephanopoulos. President Trump's media and technology group continues to swell to a value of over $13 billion. Hunter Biden's lawyers seem to have forgotten to include any facts to support their assertions. The long-running legal saga of Sam Bankman-Fried finally ended as he was sentenced today. More details are coming to light of what happened to the container ship before it collapsed the bridge in Baltimore. The black box from the ship involved in the Baltimore Bridge accident has been handed over to an official agency for analysis. From preliminary information, it appears that the accident was caused by a loss of power on the vessel. Okay, let's get into it. On Wednesday, U.S. federal safety officials cited audio from the freighter's black box that indicated that minutes before the dally struck the Baltimore Bridge, the freighter's pilot radioed for help from a tugboat. He reported that the ship had lost power. This sheds new light on this deadly disaster. Video showed the lights going out on the ship just before the collision. Early on Wednesday, a team from the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, boarded the freighter dally and began interviewing the ship's two pilots and the 21 regular crew members. Investigators reviewed information that was collected in the vessel's data recorder, VDR. This included radio communications between the pilot and the shore authorities prior to the disaster. At a press conference on Wednesday night, NTSB officials said that they heard the call for tugboat assistance just minutes before the accident. Later, there were radio reports that the ship had lost all power and was approaching the bridge. The data logger also captured a command for the crew to drop anchor, presumably to slow down the vessel. NTSB chairwoman Jennifer Homendi said that the data on the recorder was consistent with a power outage, but it remains to be confirmed whether the freighter actually lost power. But video footage of the incident does show the lights on the cargo ship flickering for a moment, then coming on briefly before going out again. NTSB officials also said that the Francis Scott Key Bridge that was built in 1976 lacked the common structural engineering redundancy of newer bridges. This made it more susceptible to the catastrophic collapse. The collision swept much of the bridge into the mouth of the Patapsco River. This blocked navigation and forced the port of Baltimore to close indefinitely. The U.S. Coast Guard's top priority is to restore the channel to stabilize the unpowered vessel and to rescue it. This is according to what Deputy Commander Peter Goche said at a White House press briefing. On March 27th, a federal judge questioned the lack of evidence provided by attorneys who are representing Hunter Biden during a hearing in Los Angeles. The attorneys sought to drop several tax-related charges. The Los Angeles case results from a multi-year investigation by special counsel David Weiss. Weiss watched Wednesday's court session from the gallery. Judge Mark Scarcy heard arguments from Hunter Biden's lawyers for several hours. The arguments were about eight motions that were filed to dismiss the case. However, the judge said that many claims were not backed by factual evidence. This includes the allegation that the charges were politically motivated. Judge Scarcy told Hunter Biden's lead attorney, Abe Lowell, during a discussion about his claim that Hunter Biden was selectively prosecuted, he said, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that anything in Congress or the whistleblowers influenced the prosecution. Lowell admitted that he didn't have evidence, but he claimed that rank partisans pushed for charges. A ruling on the motion is expected by April 17th on the defendant's claims. These claims include claims that Los Angeles is an improper venue, the special counsel was not funded correctly, and 
the government has engaged in outrageous conduct. During arguments, Lowell claimed that Republicans, the media, and Russian disinformation were the driving force behind the charges. Lowell also claimed that the case should be tossed because the two sides agreed to sign a plea agreement in Hunter Biden's Delaware case involving tax and firearm related charges. But the government threw out the plea agreement, which was not finalized, and they moved ahead with the trial in that case. The defense argued that the plea agreement gave Hunter Biden immunity from criminal prosecution over charges related to taxes, guns, and drugs. However, government prosecutors disputed this claim. They noted that the plea agreement was never signed. Hunter Biden's team also offered a timeline instead of evidence to back up allegations of outrageous government conduct. They alleged that IRS agents Gary Shapley and Joseph Ziegler and Republicans were behind the three felony counts and six misdemeanor counts that were filed against Hunter Biden in Los Angeles. This was after the Delaware plea agreement was abandoned. Lead criminal prosecutor Leo Wise agreed with the judge saying that the motion lacked facts. Wise told the judge in all the motions, they say that we had bad motives. They say we were sloppy. We sat on our hands and tell the partisan interference. This is not true. We didn't need to gin up an indictment. Before I move on, I want to tell you about the shocking story about Chris Miller, the former Trump Secretary of Defense. He recently revealed that the House January 6th committee pressured him into staying silent about the 10,000 National Guard troops. We discussed the details on our Ganjing World platform so that we could talk about it in more depth. I'll leave the link in the description below. Please watch it there. Okay, let's get back into it. House Oversight Chairman Representative James Comer sent a letter to U.S. Department of Energy Secretary Jennifer Grandholm on Wednesday. He invited her to testify before the Committee on Oversight and Accountability. In the letter, Grandholm is asked to testify on various issues on May 15th at a committee hearing. This includes the alleged misuse of the nation's strategic petroleum reserve and the Energy Department's halt on liquefied natural gas LNG transports. It also includes her personal taxpayer-funded electric vehicle road trip last summer, as well as increased spending. Comer wrote, the committee has held hearings with department spending levels, energy efficiency standards, critical minerals, and nuclear energy. The expansive nature of these topics and your direct involvement as the leader of the department necessitates your participation in this hearing. However, the DOE has not yet provided Grand Home's testimony availability. This is despite multiple scheduling attempts by her staff over the past two months. They initially invited Grand Home to a hearing in March by contacting her staff on January 23rd, 2024. The initial date proposed was March 6th, but Grand Home's staff declined stating that she would be unavailable. Comer's office offered Grand Home additional hearing dates. This includes April 30th, May 1st, May 15th through 16th, and June 12th through 13th. However, the Energy Department has declined to provide her availability. The department only made Deputy Secretary David Turk available to testify on the proposed dates in May or June. However, this was unacceptable to Comer. So this time, Comer, in order to avoid any further delay in scheduling this hearing, and to reiterate his invitation to her to testify instead of a subordinate official, wrote to Grandholm directly. Grandholm was asked to confirm her appearance to testify and to submit written testimony at least two days before the hearing. Earlier this month, the Oversight Committee also initiated an investigation into the DOE. This was after the Biden administration announced its order to block new LNG export licenses in January. Joe Biden cited concerns about the UN predicted climate crisis and that the administration would reevaluate LNG exports on energy costs, energy security, and the environment. In a previous letter to Granholm on March 18th, House Republicans called on the DOE 
to turn over all documents and communications to the White House. The document showed that by April 1st, LNG exports would cease. Republicans wrote at a time when war is ongoing in Ukraine and tensions are rising in the Middle East and Asia, it is particularly important that allied nations can rely on the United States for a reliable long-term fuel supply. Days later on March 21st, Texas and 15 other states filed a lawsuit against the Biden administration over the LNG export pause. The states have asked the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Louisiana to overturn the pause. They argue that it is unlawful and raises serious questions of national security. American broadcasting companies and ABC News have sought a 30-day delay in responding to President Trump's defamation lawsuit. President Trump recently sued the network and its host, George Stephanopoulos. In his lawsuit, President Trump argues that Stephanopoulos made a dozen defamatory remarks on air on March 10th. The host repeatedly stated that a jury had found President Trump liable for the rape of writer E. Jean Carroll. Based on the court filing, ABC, which was served on March 19th, approached President Trump's attorneys the next day. They agreed to accept service for Stephanopoulos, who had not been served. ABC had until April 9th to file a response motion, while Stephanopoulos had until May 20th to respond. ABC has now requested a uniform response date of May 10th. At the heart of the lawsuit are remarks made by the host of This Week with George Stephanopoulos on March 10th. These remarks were made during an interview with Representative Nancy Mace. The complaint alleges that Stephanopoulos repeatedly stated that a jury had found President Trump liable for the rape of writer E. Jean Carroll. This was despite being aware of the truth. During the heated interview, Nancy Mace, who was also a victim of rape at 16, accused the host of shaming her. Stephanopoulos repeatedly claimed that President Trump had been found liable for rape. In one case, he said, Judges in two separate juries have found him liable for rape and for defaming a victim of that rape. He also said in another claim that Donald Trump has been found liable for rape by a jury. Stephanopoulos even pressed that. I'm asking you a question about why you endorsed someone who's been found liable for rape. So President Trump's complaint argues that Stephanopoulos was aware that the jury did not find President Trump liable for rape. However, he falsely stated the opposite and even tried to shame Nancy Mace for endorsing President Trump. Recently, Fulton County Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee ordered an immediate review for President Trump's RICO co-defendant Harrison Floyd's appeal. The appeal argues that District Attorney Fannie Willis overstepped her authority when she sought an election-related indictment. Floyd, who was a leader for Black Voices for Trump, was charged with three counts, count one, RICO, and counts 30 and 31, which were conspiracy to commit solicitation of false statements and writings and influencing a witness. Floyd's lawyers filed a motion last week asking the judge's permission to appeal his previous ruling on a plea that was filed last year. The filing argued that Fannie Willis overstepped her authority when she sought an election-related indictment against Floyd without a referral from the state election board. And now, after months of back and forth, Scott McAfee finally granted a certificate of immediate review. On Wednesday, Tony Suruga dropped a bombshell. If true, it could blow up the whole Stormy Daniels affair with Donald Trump allegation that the mainstream media has been clinging to since 2015. Suruga is a popular commentator on X. In his profile, the conservative commentator with over 77,000 followers states that he is an Intel Ops CIA NSA contractor whistleblower. Suruga claims that he shared office space with Michael Avenatti. Avenatti is the convicted felon and former attorney who represented Stormy Daniels. 
Daniels alleged that then presidential candidate Donald Trump paid her hush money to keep their alleged affair private. Saruga posted on X, I spoke with Michael Evanotti, who at one time had an office in the same building as one of my businesses in Newport Beach, California. Saruga claimed how the conversation between him and Evanotti was initiated. Saruga said Evanotti was working a long con against Tully's Coffee and actor Patrick Dempsey. Evanotti Global Baristas, the parent company of the Tully's Coffee chain that was founded by Michael Evanotti, had agreed to never again use the Tully's name, but Evanotti was lying. He wanted to use my trademark attorney, Rod Underhill, to take control of the Tully's Coffee name and trademarks. I learned later it was yet another attempt to extort money from Keurig Green Mountain. And here's where Saruga's story becomes interesting since it relates to Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen. Saruga posted, Evan Audi shared details of his client, Stormy Daniels, whose real name is Stephanie Clifford Case, and the fact that her and Michael Cohen were actually having an affair since 2006. And then Saruga dropped the bombshell. He said the whole hush money scheme was cooked up by Michael Cohen to extort the Trump organization before the 2016 election. Evan Audi seemed pleased at how deviant Michael Cohen was. Saruga followed up his first tweet by explaining how Evan Audi bragged about the plan more than once. Evan Audi even bragged about it to former NBA star Dennis Rodman on the patio in Corona Del Mar. In addition to being one of the all-time best defense players in the NBA, Rodman is known for his relationship with Madonna and for his unusual friendship with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. So it's pretty easy to believe that Rodman could be friends with Evan Audi. Saruga also said, one time in fact, he was bragging about it to Dennis Rodman at the Port restaurant out on the patio in Corona Del Mar, California. I was only half listening as I had heard it all before, but Dennis Rodman seemed engaged in the conversation. On Monday, when asked by reporters, President Trump said that he would testify in the alleged hush money trial in New York City. President Trump said, I would have no problem testifying. I didn't do anything wrong. President Trump also suggested that he will appeal the April 15th trial date. So President Trump said that he's unsure if the trial will even follow his appeal. Meanwhile, the verdict in President Trump's civil fraud case casts a dark cloud over New York business transactions, even though investors won't publicly admit it. Charles Trinka, a professor of finance at Indiana University Bloomington said, if you talk to people in this market, they are very, very upset. And these are people who are neutral or even opposed to Trump. They're just angry about it. Normal business related cases are handled in the New York Courts Commercial Division. And they are decided by judges who have specific, sophisticated knowledge of commercial law and business practices. But the Trump case didn't go that route. This is because New York Attorney General Letitia James found a novel way to use New York's anti-fraud law. A source told the Epoch Times, this case proceeded in just a highly irregular fashion from the start. Legal scholar Jonathan Turley agrees that the case has far-reaching implications. Turley told Fox News, this has really done great damage to the New York legal system. Businesses are looking at this with a degree of horror that a judge could come up with a figure so large you have to sell parts of your business just to get an appeal. Trinka and two other people who are familiar with the case told the Epoch Times that the case would discourage investors from doing business in New York State. This is because President Trump was simply following normal business practices and no one was harmed. Trinka said, all the parties under this civil case were satisfied. I've never heard of a victimless civil case that even won $500 million. Trinka believes that the fundamental reason that President Trump was unable to convince any surety company or banks to guarantee the initial $464 million in bonds 
was that those companies did not want to be associated with President Trump at a time like this. Trinka said, I don't think a bonding company or a bank is willing to be associated with Donald Trump because the attorney general could turn around and sue them. It's clearly unfair to request President Trump to materialize those funds so fast. An insider who anonymously spoke to the Epoch Times said, this time frame is insane. I've been given more time to pay a parking ticket in New York City than Donald Trump was given to pay a $500 million bond. In New York, parking violators can delay payment and late fees for about 100 days before facing a court judgment with interest. Shares of the Trump Media and Technology Group surged higher again on Wednesday. They rose 14.2% to $66.22. The market value of Trump's social media group is now over $13 billion. TMTG has been at the top of the hot stocks list for several hours on the Wall Street Bets section of Reddit's popular stock trading forum. TMTG's value has risen by a third since Tuesday, and on the books, those gains have resulted in a windfall of about $5.3 billion for President Trump. Comedian Jon Stewart is facing online criticism after a new report showed that he overvalued his New York home during a sale. The revelation came after Stewart devoted an episode of his show to criticizing President Trump over his New York civil case involving real estate valuations. On Monday's show, Stewart accused President Trump of lying about the valuation of some of his properties. Stewart claimed that President Trump's shenanigans cost the city of New York. However, documents obtained by the New York Post appear to show that John Stewart once overvalued his own New York home by more than $16 million. In 2014, the comedian reportedly sold his 6,280 square foot Tribeca duplex to financier Parag Panda for $17.5 million. However, according to 2013-2014 assessor records, the property had an estimated market value of $1.8 million. For property tax purposes, the actual assessor valuation was about $847,000. Records also show that Stewart paid property taxes based on that assessor's valuation price. This is what he accused President Trump of doing. As a result, Stewart has faced an online backlash following the report. On March 28th, the long-running legal saga of Sang Bankman Freed finally ended. This was when Judge Lewis Kaplan announced the FTX founder's sentence during a hearing at the U.S. courthouse in Lower Manhattan. In November of 2023, jurors convicted Bankman Freed of all seven counts of conspiracy and fraud that he was charged with. Bankman Freed and his attorneys have repeatedly argued that he didn't intentionally do anything wrong. They also argued that he deserves no more than six and a half years in jail. In his trial testimony in October of 2023, Bankman Freed insisted he used sophisticated analytics to monitor FTX's finances. He suggested that subordinates acting without his knowledge or approval made costly mistakes. However, prosecutors strongly disagreed and they wanted a sentence of half a century or longer. After hearing all the arguments, Judge Kaplan sentenced Bankman Freed to 25 years in prison for defrauding investors out of $8 billion in the fallen cryptocurrency exchange, FTX. The judge also ordered forfeiture of $11.2 billion, but he did not order restitution. He said that it would be impractical because there are so many victims. Judge Kaplan said, that Bankman Freed knew it was wrong. He knew it was criminal. He regrets that he made a very bad bet about the likelihood of getting caught, but he is not going to admit a thing as is his right. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you, but please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. 
We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.